Good morning, and thank you so much for being here. And I'm glad that I have the opportunity to be here. Um, some of you know me, and many of you don't, but uh, I've been attending here some, and, and uh, Pastor Chad and I, we go way back. And I told him I was going to tell some jokes on him since he was out of town this week, but uh, I'm going to surpass, surpass that, and... Uh, and get on into the message this morning, but uh, just uh, appreciate you being here, and I ask you to be praying for me. I, I've had some issues of late, and, um, and so uh, I just would covet your prayers uh, and uh, some medical issues and things, so just I would covet your prayers for those things. But um, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd invite you to turn to Ephesians. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. This morning I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. It says this, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, and that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his, <clears throat> shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for a glorious and a beautiful day that you've given us to come into your house and worship you on this Memorial Day weekend. Lord, as we have opportunity to uh, not only remember these graduates as they have, are embarking on new uh, things in their life. We also take time out to remember those that gave the ultimate sacrifice that we may have the freedom to be able to gather here today. We pray now, Lord, that you'd give us freedom in this service, Lord. The Holy Spirit would move freely as we look to your word and as we see how the church in the 21st century, this post-pandemic church, how we are going to not only survive, but how we're going to flourish as the people of God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the title of the message this morning is The Post-Pandemic Church. So what should she not look like? And I'm using both she and it. She as in the universal church, it is in the local church this morning. But what should she not look like? She should not be a weak church. We shouldn't have any weak churches. Amen? She should not have... Mix sermons like a McDonald's fast food come in and grab and go, 
or theologically weak sermons. We should not have cotton candy youth ministry. It's sweet, but it's gone. It has no feel to it. We should not have glorified babysitting service in place of children's ministry. We should not just be a social gospel ministry, and we should not have dried up baptistries. And we should not be irrelevant in the community in which we live. Unfortunately, so many churches are just that. If they close today, no one would even realize it in the community in which they live. That's sad. What should she look like? She should be strong. She should have God-convicting, honoring, strong, text-driven Bible preaching. Amen? I can say without any doubt or reservation, here with Brother Chad, you have a text-driven preacher. And I, I appreciate that. She should be sound theologically in her youth ministry. You know, what do I mean by that? Sound theologically. Well, we just had all these graduates come and sit here and we prayed over them. And they've had some tough classes. Matter of fact, they were, as a youth, they, they, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, they had to take probably algebra. They had to take maybe trigonometry. They might have had to take calculus. They might have had to take pre-physics. They might have had to take physics. So praise God, they can take some theology, amen? You know, they're smart enough to handle all those things. They're smart enough to get theology in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? It should not be cotton candy youth ministry. The church should have family-oriented doctrinal Christian ministry. They should have Holy Spirit leading praise and worship Thank God for the praise and worship here. I've seen many churches that have gone through the worship wars and they didn't come out on the other side, in my opinion, to be pleasing unto the Lord. Church should be exciting and vibrant should be that because we're God's people. We come into the church. It should be a place of worship and excitement and joy and happiness and and conviction. The church should be an evangelistic church. The church should be a fasting and praying church. I mean, are we a people of prayer? Yes, and I appreciate that. I get, I'm on the, uh, the email list, and, and I get those emails all the time that you're sending of uh, folks that need to be prayed for, going through difficult troubles and times and everything. And, and it is still the same. God's people need prayer. And we have power in prayer. And so, church family, pray, 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 and fast. What's facing the church in this 21st century? Just think about that. What is facing us? If you turn on the news, what all do we hear other than just negative banter back and forth that doesn't mean much? The church is facing critical race theory. It's a theory. So many folks want to adopt that, but it's, it's demoralizing and it goes against what we as Southern Baptists believe. It goes against the Baptist faith and message. That's our doctrinal statement. The church is facing this woke culture. 
woke culture. The church is facing the defund the police movement. Who would have ever thought that in America that we'd be talking about defunding the police? We're dealing with the Equality Act. This is all about gender dysphoria. I mean, talk about a messed up world in which the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is operating in. Now, who would have ever thought that we'd be having this type of discussion whether a boy can say I'm a girl and a girl can say I'm a boy and you just got to take their word for it. Religious persecution is on the rise. Government intrusiveness is on the rise in America. And maybe one of the most difficult things in the local church is this and it doesn't come from outside it comes from inside and that is apathy based church family it's like we got a church full of spiritual eeyores woe is me you know you know what I'm talking about some of you got that some of you didn't yeah, that's okay so what does the post pandemic church need to do now to get ready So the post-pandemic church needs to have a game plan or a battle plan, okay? No coach goes into competition of play without a game plan, and no general is going into battle without a battle plan to win. Amen? All right, so the church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to have either a game plan or a battle plan, whatever you want to call it, So she, can have, so she can succeed in the ministry of the local church. We have the great commission that leads us to know what we ought to be doing. But there's so much that goes along with that. And, you know, student ministry, children's ministry, student ministry, college ministry, adult ministry, senior adult ministry... All the ministries of the local church have opportunities to do great and mighty things. We need a clear and defined battle plan to get in there and get it done. Because we have people outside of these walls that are going to hell. They're going to hell because they do not have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. To the post-pandemic church, it does not need to set herself up for failure when trying to do ministry without a well-thought-out and Holy Spirit-led plan. Since no general goes into battle without a battle plan, then what is the battle plan for the church? What's the battle plan for this church? The church of the Lord Jesus Christ should be a church of new life, This is what has happened to each of us who have been saved and have put our faith and trust in Him. So listen, as a recap, before we get into the text this morning, the post-pandemic church needs to be a praying church, needs to be a fasting church, needs to be a church that cries out to the Lord, needs to be a preaching church. Needs to be a worshiping church. Needs to be a discipleship church. Needs to be an evangelizing church. And an equipping of the saints church. With a holy God, we should have a mentality that... Have some props here. We should have the mentality and the excitement... And everything, when we come to church, we should be fired up, right? We serve a risen Savior. He's not in the tomb anymore, amen? We serve a risen Savior. We should be excited about what God is doing, right? We should be courageous about what God is doing. When we are out in public, 
We should not be ashamed of the gospel. We should be, we should be forthcoming and sharing the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Normally, at this point in this message right here, I would have a bunch of youth sitting right here and I'd be shooting them with water. All right? Amen. There you go. Right. So you might say, what's this crazy fool doing with water guns? Well, they don't have any water in them. But here's the question. Who's with me? Who is willing to storm hell with a water pistol? Right? That's the type of excitement we, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, should have. We should be willing to storm hell with a water pistol. Amen? Yes? Youth that just graduated, who's with me? Yes, amen. Right there we go. Sign him up, amen. Yes, that's the type of mentality we, as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, that's the type of mentality we ought to be having where we are willing to storm hell with a water pistol. So, Getting to the text this morning. This maj majestic passage here uses the human institution of marriage to illustrate the relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ and His bride, the church. When we talk about the church, we need to be clear that we are speaking about every saved person, wherever they may be found. You see, the word church comes from a word that means a called out assembly. The true church is comprised of every person called out of sin and assembled together in Jesus Christ. When we think of the church, of course, we think of our local assembly. That is right and proper. Every person where and who has been saved by grace is a true member of the church of Jesus Christ. Now, people are always finding fault with the church. In fact, there are too many people who are far too good at pointing out what they think is wrong in the church. Well, unless you haven't figured it out, no local church is perfect. Anytime people are involved in an organization, that organization will be far less than perfect. Therefore, if you are looking for fault, you can be sure that you will find it. Amen? Yes. Some of the sweetest people I know are in the church. Some of the meanest people I know are in the church. Regardless of our opinions of what the local church should look like, God the Father orchestrated her. Jesus Christ died for her, and the Holy Spirit lives in her. She is the right way Forward. She is an institution that must be a beacon, a lighthouse, a hospital for sinners, a safe place for the hurting, where truth is found and where love abounds. So what does the Bible say? Why is it the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why is it the best institution to represent Him going into this 21st century as a post-pandemic church? Number one, it has the right creation. We see this in 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ. Listen, folks. It was planned by the fathers. You see in Ephesians 1.3. It was purchased by the Son. Amen? We see this in Ephesians 1, 6, and 7. It was processed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Number two, why it is so important as the institution is because it has the right components. What makes up this church? Well, you and I do, amen? 
So it has the right components we see in Ephesians here in chapter 5, verses 25 and tw- through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself... The church in all her glory, having no spot, listen to this, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Underline that. Holy and blameless. We're talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ here. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be holy and blameless. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 says, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love, He predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters. Those are the components right there. You and I are the components. As sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. You and I make up those components. We see this because we are saved sinners, right? We're saved sinners. We see it in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Praise God for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, for she still gives an old wretch like you and I new hope and new life that can only be found in Christ Jesus. All sin is forgiven. Past sin, present sin, future sin. Amen? We are saved sinners. But you know what else we are? We're not perfect, are we? We're also stumbling saints. We're still going to sin. Romans 7 talks about this. We are all going to stumble in our faith. Being saved does not make you perfect, but it should make you strive to be perfect. That's what the Bible says. We are to strive to be like Christ. Christ is perfect. Amen? And so we ought to be living and striving to be like Christ. Years ago, you know, those little bracelets, you know, WWJD, what would Jesus do, you know? That was a fad that, that came and went. But we ought to be shining sons and daughters. 1 John 3, 1 through 2 says, We need to be light in a dying and dark world. Who in here remembers this? Who remembers that little song? This little light of mine. You remember that? Yes? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let... That's exactly what we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, as shining sons and daughters, we need to be shining. We need to let that light shine in our lives. We see it in 1 John talks about that. But the third thing the church needs to do is that it has the right communication. This is why it is so important and it's why going forward in this post-pandemic world in which we live is because the institution of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has the right communication. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, "For, For I handed down to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Listen, church. Not only do we have the right communication, because it comes from the right place. Amen? Right here. Right? We a people of the book or not? 
So we have the right communication. And the one doing the communicating, if we'll only listen, amen? We're stubborn sometimes. We don't like to listen. But it is also true that under the right communication falls a powerful communication, as we see in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed, Romans says, of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You and I generally fit into that Greek category, amen? So don't be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Bible says. We need not be ashamed of the gospel. That's why I stand here today behind this sacred desk and proclaim the gospel. Many of you may think this is just a podium up here. No. This is where God's word goes. This is where the Holy Spirit, through whoever the man of God is that is presenting God's word, stands behind this sacred desk of learning. And it's not me teaching so you learn, but it's the Holy Spirit speaking through me. And I'm praying here this morning that my words are His words and His words are my words. The second thing is that we need to have, and, it, and, it, and the church has this, a pleasant communication. Romans 10, 13, Revelation 21, 17, John 3, 16. It's about good news. Right? John 3, 16, we, we understand that. We know that verse. It's about the good news. That is pleasant for folks to understand that they too can have the joy that comes with being a born again believer in Jesus Christ. They too can have that. It is also not just a pleasant communication, but it is a perfect communication. John 6, 37, Romans 10, 10. For with the heart... A person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. It is perfect communication. Because in the blink of an eye, a dead person can be brought to life. Amen? You and I have been there. How many of you have... Uh, Ever watched, uh, now I'm going to have you hold your hands up. How many of you have ever watched uh, Walking Dead? Yeah, I, there's some of you in here willing to admit it. Well, you know, in Walking Dead, you had these zombies. You know, they're, they were alive, then they, they died, and then they came back as these zombies, you know. And they're, you know, I'll probably regret this when I watch it on the video, but, you know, they're, they're like, right exactly that's what we have in this day and age we have walking around a lot of dead people because they have not been resurrected in Christ Jesus they're dead in their trespasses and sin and so the people of God God's people have got to be out there pounding the pavement, sharing our faith, because we have that pleasant communication. We have that perfect communication that is given to us by God Himself. We don't need to be timid. A fourth thing that we need, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has as an institution is that it has the right challenge going forth. 
Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Listen, saints, we ought to be edifying. We should be the ones edifying. What does that word mean? It means to lift up the saints. It also reminds me of a, as an old hymn that we used to sing a lot. You know, it's, Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Remember that? I wasn't quite on there, just, but uh, if I had a piano or something, I probably would have been him. But uh, we ought to be uplifting, edifying of the saints, but we also must exalt the Savior. Exalt the Savior. We see this all throughout God's Word, Hebrews, 1 Corinthians, Colossians. Praise Jesus is what exalt means. Praise Jesus to the highest. As I was standing in the garden tomb in Jerusalem, I can tell you without hesitation, Jesus is not there. Amen? The garden tomb is where they laid Jesus. You can go there, you can go inside now, and you can see where they laid Jesus. Standing there in the garden tomb, I sang on three different occasions. I've been there three times, praise God. I sang this very song. I exalt thee. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O Lord. We ought to be a people who exalts and exalts our Savior because He has saved us. But we need to be evangelizing the sinner. Be like Philip. Be ready in season and out of season. Go to that Ethiopian eunuch and share the gospel. We have to do it. We have to do it. If we have the courage and the excitement and everything that we're willing to storm hell with a water pistol, then surely the goodness we can Storm East L.J. with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So finally, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it has the right conclusion. Amen? The church has the right conclusion. Ephesians 5.27 here that he might present to himself the church. At the conclusion, he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be, what? Holy and blameless. Many churches are getting stumbled up over that. There's two things that go along with the right conclusion, and that is the fact that we have the blessing of our hope, that hope that is only found in Christ Jesus. In Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. 
Praise God, we don't have to look very far. Amen. We have that blessed hope. And we also, though, have that blessing of our home where we're going to spend the eternity with God the Father. What is even more scarier than the fact that a person is going to die and go to a hell without Christ is the fact that a person is going to die and go to a place where God is not. That should be one of the most scariest things about dying without knowing Christ. But praise God, if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have the blessing of our home. John 14 says, Do not let your heart be troubled when you're thinking about where you're going. Saints of God, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If that were not so, I would have told you. Because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again. And will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Amen? Yes, this is the right institution going forward. This is our understanding of this post-pandemic church. Now, there's some specifics to the battle plan that each church has got to do. But God has laid it out for us here to know, hey, these are the main things you need to be doing. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't just get away with wearing a cross around our neck. Or wearing a bracelet on our arm. Because we've been bought for and paid for with the blood of Christ. And we've been given that wonderful and great opportunity to follow Him, to serve Him, to love Him, and if necessary, to die for Him. Because He's our Savior, and He's our Lord. Let us pray.